Hey everyone, welcome to part one of the cardiovascular system. So we've discussed blood and we've discussed what's in blood, both from a hematological perspective and an immunological one. That's a hard word to say. Um, and now we're going to move on to the pump and the tubes through which all of that stuff moves. So let us begin. So the heart is a muscular bag. It's made of cardiac muscle. Um, and since you guys have all taken Biology 160, you've actually been seeing cardiac muscle since you began down this pursuit of becoming healthcare professionals because we introduce cardiac muscle as one of the muscle types um, in Biology 160. So remember, that's that muscle that is striated like skeletal muscle, but unlike skeletal muscle, it's got intercalated discs and branching. More on that later. So that's what the heart is made of primarily, and it's a double pump, meaning that there's two sides of the heart, the right and the left, and those sides of the heart gather blood from and send blood to two separate circuits. So those separate circuits are the systemic circuit, which is the arteries and veins that carry blood from your heart to your peripheral tissues and then back to your heart via the veins. So these are things with familiar names to you, like your aorta, for example, or your femoral artery. There's also the pulmonary circuit, and the pulmonary circuit takes oxygen-poor blood from your lungs, or excuse me, from the system, and sends it to your lungs to pick up oxygen. So this is why uh, Illnesses and treatments for illnesses uh, are often referred to by the term cardiopulmonary, and that's because of the very close relationship that the lungs and the heart have. So the point of your heart is to move blood around your body, allowing oxygen and nutrients to be carried to your tissues. Where that oxygen comes from is your lungs. So your heart also has to move blood to your lungs to get that oxygen in the first place. So there's an intimate connection between the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. This is also the reason why certain types of heart failure, for example, can create problems with the lungs. Pulmonary edema, for example, uh, the buildup of fluid in the lungs is one consequence of heart failure specifically left heart failure because you get back pressure to the lungs. So that's what double pump means. So both circuits, both between the periphery and the heart and the lungs and the heart, have arteries, capillaries, and veins. So classically, students have been sort of trained to view arteries as being red, quote unquote, and veins as being blue because one carries oxygen-rich blood and the other carries oxygen-poor blood. Also notice I'm not using the word deoxygenated and oxygenated because it's actually not the case that blood in your veins has no oxygen. It, does, it just doesn't have as much. So we'll talk about venous reserve later as well. So in the pulmonary circuit, blood is being carried away from the heart in a deoxygenated state. Oopsie, there I said it by accident. Whoops. Oxygen poor is what I mean. So oxygen poor blood is carried away from the heart towards the lungs. And yet you can see arteries here are colored blue. Why is that? Well, arteries does not mean carrier of oxygen rich blood. Arteries does mean a vessel that carries blood away from the heart. Veins, by contrast, are those vessels which carry blood toward the heart, and in the pulmonary circuit, the pulmonary veins are carrying oxygen-rich blood back to the heart so that the heart can redistribute that blood to the system. So beware of looking at a vessel illustration and thinking, ah, blue, it must be a vein. Double check which circuit you're in because that may not be true. So I'm gonna reserve uh, most of the anatomy here for lab because that's where it comes in to play the most. And I believe that um, Christina Wallace has provided lab instruction videos already, but I will be producing my own as well. Um, but I do want to acknowledge the pericardial layers real quick, as well as the differences between the atria and the ventricles. So just, quick crash course in, in cardiac anatomy. 
Um, the heart is a muscular bag with four chambers. So the top two are called the atria, and there's a right one and a left one. Oracle is just this little ear-like portion that kind of pokes over the front. These bottom two chambers are more muscular, and these are the right and the left ventricles, respectively. Between each of the sides is the interventricular septum, visible when you cut the heart in half. And between each atrium and its corresponding ventricle, there is a valve. The valve on the right side is called the tricuspid valve, and the valve on the left side is called the bicuspid or mitral valve. So the valves prevent blood from moving backwards within the heart, and we'll talk about valves too. The pericardium is a double-layered sac that surrounds the heart. So let's actually zoom in on it real quick. No, not make a dot on it. I want to zoom. There we go. So the pericardium looks like this, where there is a thin layer that lines the surface of the heart. You can't really see that. Let's switch colors. And the surface of the heart lining is called the epicardium, which is also referred to as the visceral pericardium. So this is a thin layer of mesothelium, which is a squamous cell epithelial type, and then underneath of it, a little bit of connective tissue. So this covers over the outer surface of the heart. And then there's a space, and this space is the pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity is the space between pericardial layers. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because students get the mediastinum, which is the space in the chest where the heart sits, and the pericardial cavity mixed up. The mediastinum is the thoracic space between the two lungs, which contains not only the heart, but also the trachea and the esophagus. It's not the same thing as the pericardial cavity. The pericardial cavity is the small potential space between the visceral and parietal pericardium. Now I say potential space because ordinarily these two layers are touching each other and they're only separated by a very thin layer of fluid. And that fluid is there to reduce friction. The myocardium is made of a mixture of cardiac muscle cells and connective tissue of the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So let's go back to normal size and move right along. So from largest to smallest, cavity-wise, the heart is located in the ventral cavity. So that includes the thoracic cavity. Within the thorax, there are the pleural cavities that contain each lung. And between those two cavities, there is the mediastinal cavity, or mediastinum. And that is that vase-shaped space that contains the heart, esophagus, and the trachea. The pericardial cavity is the small potential space between the epicardium and the parietal pericardium. So the pericardium is the combo of the visceral and parietal pericardium. So that whole sac. So that's what that means. And this has uh, some really important functions, including but not limited to it lubricates the heart because the heart's in constant motion. It also protects the heart and isolates it from neighboring tissues. Um, so it has a variety of functions that are very important to the extent that infection of the pericardium is very, very dangerous because it can very quickly impair heart function. So here's an overview of the pericardium. And I like this analogy because this is more relatable for most people. So it's like punching a balloon. The visceral pericardium, also called the epicardium, is like the part of the balloon that touches your fist. And then on the other side of a little airspace corresponding to the pericardial cavity, there's the parietal pericardium. So the other piece of the puzzle that I haven't mentioned yet, because the parietal and the visceral pericardium are both mesothelium covering over areolar tissue. So mesothelium is going to be secreting that exudate that uh, 
that's the pericardial fluid that basically prevents friction from happening as the heart is in motion in the cavity. But there's also the fibrous pericardium on the outside of the parietal. So the fibrous pericardium has a more structural role. Um, it's tougher and that allows it to isolate the pericardium from neighboring tissues and protect the heart, but it also prevents overstretch. So it's resistant to stretching because it's stiffer collagen and it further serves to anchor the heart. So it not only is the heart sitting here beating, but at the bottom, it's kind of glued to the diaphragm by this fibrous attachment. And that keeps it from wiggling around in the thorax as it beats, especially if it's doing a lot of work. Like say, think about some time when you were exercising really hard and your heart was thudding in your chest. What's keeping it from bopping around all over your thorax? Well, your fibrous pericardium is. So I mentioned the epicard epicardium already and the myocardium. What I haven't mentioned yet is the endocardium. The endocardium is the endothelial lining on the inside of the chambers of the heart. So inside of the atria and inside of the ventricles. It is also an endothelium overlying areolar tissue. So in that regard, it's not that different from either the parietal pericardium's non-fibrous layer or the epicardium as far as what it's made out of. It is confluent as well with the lining of the vessels. So there is no place where like it stops abruptly and the vessel lining starts. They're just kind of smoothly meld in one to the other. So I mentioned pericarditis earlier um, as an inflammation of the pericardium, which can impair heart function. It is also possible to get endocarditis. It is far less common, but it does happen. So since I know a lot of my students are preparing for careers in the medical sciences, and some of you may end up working in uh, hospitals and emergency units, etc., um, it makes sense to mention, you know, common causes of certain illnesses that you see a lot. So unfortunately, the United States has a problem with uh, drug use, specifically opiates and opioids. So among drug users that choose those drugs are people that use intravenous drugs, both opioids and others. Um, and so endocarditis is one outcome of that style of drug use. So when people use dirty needles, they introduce bacteria and viruses into their bloodstream. And because the endocardium is confluent with the lining of the blood vessels, sometimes the infection ends up inflaming the inner wall of the heart. And this can be very difficult to treat because look at how much, uh, you know, tissue is between the outside and the inside. So that is one thing that exhibits comorbidity, which is the word for two pathologies co-occurring. So endocarditis sometimes exhibits comorbidity with addiction to intravenous drugs and intravenous drug use. So previously I mentioned the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Um, so this is made out of collagen. So it's not made out of cells. So this is a structural support and an electrical isolator. So it's confluent, again, uh, with the heart valves. So the heart valves are made of the same stuff that the fibrous skeleton is, which is dense irregular connective tissue. So, fibrous skeleton holds the valve apertures open, supports the heart valves, and stabilizes them. The fibrous skeleton also electrically isolates the atria from the ventricles. So, we haven't discussed the conducting system of the heart yet, but unsurprisingly, given that you know that cardiac muscle is striated, it's reasonable to suppose that the cardiomyocytes, the cardiac muscle cells, need to experience an action potential in their cell membrane in order to cause contraction to happen. So we do have electrical activity determining the action and effectiveness of the heart. The atria need to contract before the ventricles. So not only does the heart have to beat, but it has to beat in a particular order. If it doesn't, we call that an arrhythmia and that ends up being dangerous. So, in order to make sure that every time the heart beats, the atria go prior to the ventricles, there needs to be a short delay in excitation. The structure that produces that delay 
is the fibrous skeleton. It prevents the electrical excitation from spreading from the atrial cardiomyocytes down to the ventricle cardiomyocytes prematurely. Okay, so I mentioned the tricuspid and the bicuspid or mitral valve. I did not yet mention the pulmonary and aortic valves. So these two valves here that I'm circling, these are the ones that permit blood to pass from an atrium into a ventricle, either the left atrium into the left ventricle or the right atrium into the right ventricle. So most ventricular filling is passive, and that's because the atria are above the ventricles. So for, for, for a considerably long period of each cardiac cycle, which is the time it takes for the heart to complete one lubbed up, more on that later, um, the AV valves, this stands for atrioventricular, so it describes the two chambers they're separating. For most of the ventricular filling, the AV valves are open. They only close when the ventricles need to contract. So when that happens, blood fills up under these flaps and pushes the flaps towards each other, so it moves them this way, such that they close. Also note that when the AV valves are open, the aortic and pulmonary valves are closed. Um, these are also called semilunar valves. And that's because their cusps, which are these little collagenous valvey flaps, are cup-shaped. And they also look like teeth. So the semilunar name means that their cusps look kind of half moon shaped. So here's how these guys work. And also note that when the ventricles are relaxed, the AV valves are open and the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves are closed. So when blood flows back down due to gravity after being injected upwards, it fills up these little cusps and shuts the valve naturally. So, while the ventricles are actively contracting, here's what needs to happen. The contraction needs to be forceful enough to open the two semilunar valves. So the aortic valve is going to send blood to the system. Pulmonary blood is, valve is going to send blood to the lungs. So, what's keeping the left and right atrioventricular valves closed? Well, as I mentioned, blood, in response to pressure changes due to the contracting of the ventricle, begins to push on these flaps, and that pushes the flap edges together. But what's to prevent this valve from blowing inside out? So why doesn't it turn inside out, and why doesn't blood go back up this way? That's bad. Well, on the inside of each ventricle, you have these finger-like muscles called papillary muscles. So these are attached to chordae tendineae, which means tendinous cords, aka heartstrings. Heartstrings, not an acceptable anatomical term, um, but rather the way they're referred to in colloquial English. So like, you know, normal people talk, not science person talk. Um, so yes, you literally do have heartstrings. What they do is they hold these valves shut as the pressure builds in the ventricle, and it prevents this valve from opening while allowing this valve to open. So the way I like to analogize it is, let's erase all this. Let's say I have an umbrella. Wow, that is the worst umbrella I've ever drawn. Let's try that again. Okay, that's better. So the umbrella works like so, where I have a little handle, and I have the umbrella part. So in a strong wind, air is going to push on the inside of my umbrella and maybe turn it inside out. Oops. I wanted this to be red. So strong wind could very well turn my umbrella inside out. 
If you've ever held an umbrella in the wind, you know about this. So the problem with that is that if my umbrella is inside out, it now becomes a rain collection device, not a rain preventing device, and it's not useful to me. So let's say I'm in the situation and I am just fed up with having my umbrella get inverted by the stupid dumb wind. So I'm thinking about it and I'm like, hmm, I bet I could modify this umbrella to make sure that it doesn't turn inside out anymore. How would I do that? Well, how about this? I could probably, I'm gonna erase all these dots real quick. Oh no, I erased part of my umbrella. Come back, I need that part. There we go. So if I was a smart person, I could say, okay, well, my umbrella has all these little tips and this is the part that I don't want to turn inside out. So if I take some strings and I tie the little tips of the umbrella portion to the handle, then it can't turn inside out. So yes, I may get Mary Poppins away by the wind, but no longer will my umbrella invert. That is what the function of the tendinous cords in the papillary muscle is. So in my umbrella analogy, the flappy part that protects you from rain is the valve cusps. These guys are the and then the handle to which they are affixed is the papillary muscle. And overall, they are normally very effective at performing that function. So valvular regurgitation, which is the phenomenon where uh, blood blorps back up through the valve inappropriately is relatively uncommon. So there's a couple different things that can cause valvular regurgitation. One is congenital defect. So we call this a heart murmur because the, the valvular regurgitation makes a sound. It can also be due to wear, wearing out. So age. Or disorders that affect collagen. So things like Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome affect the quality of collagen and those individuals do tend to be at increased risk for valvular regurgitation not because there's anything wrong specifically with their heart valves, but rather because all of their connective tissue is weak and of poor quality, which means that the tendinous cords and the valve cusps are too. So they tend to be weaker and more flexible and therefore more prone to the valve turning inside out and not doing its job. Okay, and I have been recording video for approximately four or five hours now. So I'm going to stop and go eat food. Um, and then when we come back, we will continue our discussions of the heart, including how it does the fun electrical stuff that it does, and also how the heart muscle itself receives blood supply. That's what this next bit is all about. So I will see you in the next video uh, where we will discuss those things. Thank you for your attention as always, and I will see you next time.